Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sébastien Soubiran, I'm Director of Jardin des Sciences at the University of Strasbourg and uh, President of uh, Universeum. Um, it's my very pleasure to chair this uh, last session, session eight, uh, with the title Issues of Power, Authority and Ethics in University Museum and Collections. During this last session, we will address many big issues for our community and echo some of the discussions we had with Henry Maggi, for instance, and the round table yesterday. That is civic engagement and dealing with difficult past history or of our institution or controversial issues. Our first speaker is Nathalie Nist from the Université Libre de Bruxelles, Free University of Brussels, Museums Network. Um, in Belgium, Nathalie teaches in the Master of Cultural Management program at the Faculty of Philosophy and Social Science. And she's also the coordinator, coordinator of uh, the University Museums Network. And her research interests are relations between museum public policies and university museum and collections. And our areas of expertise are mainly museology and public cultural institution. But we know Nathalie, of course, as she's been involved in our both network uh, for a long time now, and she's currently treasurer of UMAC. Thank you, Natalie, for your engagement and commitment uh, to our community. And the title of your presentation is From the Colony to the University, the Decolonization of Mineralogical Collections. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Sebastian. I will try to put my PPT. Is it, is it working? Yes, now you have to put it in full screen. Excellent. You see it in front in, in uh, full screen? Not yet, but we will. You have to click on the, yes, this is the good one. Yes, it okay? now it's working. Perfect. Okay. So I will try to, to talk about the, that uh, question of decolonization. And I put the mineralogical collections, but it's only um, you will see a step in my uh, talk. So first of all, to talk about decolonization means to talk about the colony. So of course, in uh, Belgium, we were not we had not yet a colony at the time of the foundation of my university. As you see, it's 1834. Uh, you see the first uh, building on the left and the, the one of those of today on the right. Of course, uh, for those who doesn't know anything about the Belgian history, uh, the, the pre-colony was the property, own property of our King uh, Leopold II. And he owns the, the so-called independent state of the Congo. So I found an old postcard showing him with a view of the, the Matadi heaven. After that, uh, in uh, 1908, the uh, so-called independent state of Congo became, of course, the Belgian Congo. Uh, I don't go into the details because I would need, uh, I think, uh, a year to talk about that. And um, of course, the colony was Belgium till uh, the 60s, 1960, and uh, since the 1825, we, uh, we, the Belgian, the Belgium has also the Rwanda Urundi to manage. So I put uh, an old card, and on the left you see the King Albert the First and the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, for those who knows uh, her, she was uh, very mute in in the First World War. World War. So why decolonization at the university? Uh, of course, uh, because researchers of uh, our university, as many other in the world, work in Belgian Congo in various fields. And so they collect a uh, quantity of samples and specimens, but especially from natural sciences in our case, not ethnography, for, uh, ethnography, for example. So it was mainly botany, zoology, and geology. And I put uh, an example of uh, Professor Marcel Homes, who was a vegetal physiologist and who worked uh, very strongly with the INEAC, uh, Institut National pour l'étude agronomique du Congo Belge, to help the 
colony to develop, of course, uh, agronomical uh, exploitation of the Congo. And I have found recently an old uh, paper uh, with a small um, paper on uh, his first visit to Congo, but he went there many times. Another example is uh, another botanist, uh, Professor Paul Duvigno, um, who was uh, making research and, and collecting samples, especially in Katanga uh, during uh, the, the 50s. And he, he, bring back, he brought back to university more than uh, 100,000 uh, samples for the herbarium. So you have some, uh, some uh, pictures of him on the field and so on. And so, so that's the general context. And uh, so the, the university was living with that. Uh, of course, we have researchers today who are asking questions about that, who are making uh, uh, analysis of this. But it, it came uh, on, the, on the first stage on uh, 2018 with the, um, the occupation by students first, but after that, uh, we, we don't really know who was there. Uh, the, the grand hall of the university, so it's in that building uh, you see on the slide. And um, after that, it's organized like uh, with squatters in Utopirat, which was a kind of association, and they wanted to de-marble the ULB because that in that uh, inside this building there are many things in marble of course and so inside the building there was um, a representation of our king leopold ii the second and so as you can see it was uh, tacked and uh, so it was of course for the art historians of the university my god what did they do and so on but it was very important as, a, as a, for in the symbolic signification why did they do that? At the same time, outside the university, everywhere in Brussels, but not only, but mainly in Brussels, uh, other statues from the king were uh, tagged, as you can see, in Terbure near the Africa Museum. Um, it's a recent uh, pictures, but it was did already in uh, 2018. At the same time, uh, one of uh, the journalists, Michel Bouffiou, published some uh, papers about uh, skulls, uh, collections of skulls, not only in the University of Brussels, but also in the African Museum, in the uh, National Institute of Natural History, and so on. But um, he, uh, he, he, of course, the university has to do something because, yes, we had and we still have skulls coming from the Congo colony in our collections. They are not owned by the university. They are a deposit of a scientific association, but they are inside the walls of the university. So there, there were several papers and it was like a small scandal. And um, in fact, with some research of that journalist, it seems, no, it appears that a Professor Emil Ouze, you can see uh, when he was uh, living, was a, phys a physician, but also anthropologist. He was a fan of craniology. And so he, he, he collect many cranes, many skulls to make some comparison. And you, you can see the history, history context at that time, it was uh, expanded everywhere. So, uh, of, of course, the university, the authorities, they don't stay uh, quiet. They, they need something. And the first uh, big thing they organized was that colloquium. Uh, uh, Sebastian was there with me, uh, among others, of course, uh, on February 9, 8, 2019. And we had, after that, many uh, different actions, consecutive, debate, controversy, and so on. So I put some uh, abstracts from the, um, the website from that uh, journalist I was talking before, Michel Bouffiou. So if you, can, if you want to see, you can go and uh, just uh, have a look. And finally, so two years later only, the, there was a convention was signed between the Université de Bruxelles and Université de Lubumbashi in Congo. So the skulls now are the owning of the University of Lubumbashi, but they are still in deposit at the University of Brussels. 
So they, these, these have nothing to do but with mineralogy, I agree, but I will count. Uh, and the, at the ULB, we, the university continued to, to think about that process of decolon decolonization. Uh, last, on last March, there were a day of uh, cooperation, and it was uh, the, the, the theme was decoloniser la coopération universitaire au développement. So there was a big uh, debate, and it was very uh, struggling uh, between association, uh, you know, of Afro Afro descendants people. And, uh, but also other association and the university, but it was constructive. And uh, there is in an NGO at the university who um, uh, construct a uh, concept, uh, a guided tour, decolonial audio on the campus of Solbosch. So the campus of Solbosch is the oldest of the university. So of course it's in French, but for those who are interested by uh, the, there is the, the web link, the website there. So then why mineralogy? Of course, because of those uh, noise about decolonization, noise with, uh, not, it's not a bad uh, sense uh, signification for me. Uh, many um, responsible of collections ask themselves, what should we do with our collection? And the first one are the uh, one of mineralogy. So, the collection, of course, is in Faculté des Sciences. It was established about uh, nine, um, the, the 19, nah, 1900. And uh, it is still today a research and teaching collections. It's not really uh, displayed for, for pu public. And uh, as you know, for the mineralogist, it's not my speciality, of course. Uh, it's the classification of Struns Dana. And so, so you can see some pictures. Nathalie, but, you will have to conclude huh, at some Yes. Point. So uh, they want to, we, you will see the detail in my abstract. So they want to um, make research about the, the specimens and the samples coming from Congo, because uh, there is nothing about how those pieces came to the museum. So for example, you can see also the, the labels are very uh, simple and there is, it's only inscribed a katanga. So yes, but by who, uh, uh, how was it and so on. And you have more complete labels, but only for artifacts, not for the original pieces. So the, the, the project is to uh, work on that with students and with different faculties and departments. But I was thinking about that problematic. And so I had two questions uh, who came to my mind. Uh, so beyond the pure scientific aspect, the political and um, sorry. the political, economic, and social context of the colony in which the professors and researchers have collected these samples have to be studied, have to be shown, have to be explored, and also the market value of the piece concerned, because some of the, those pieces have a monetary value. So that I had the, 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 the example of one professor, Maurice Cobert, who works in Katanga. He's, he was a geologist. And he uh, worked with the um, industry, the mining industry. So uh, it, was, it is clear that if there is scientific research, there are, th that research is also at the service of the industry, of the economy of the colony. That's the first thing. But we have to show it by uh, research, of course. And the other thing is that uh, we have to, to, to question the fact that those samples have a monetary value and that the value they have, it comes also for the color. So it's another point to uh, explore. I have here a good example of a, a sample of cuprit from the Katanga of the museum and the price it can uh, have on the web, on a website uh, sending uh, uh, samples like that. You see, it's not nothing, it's not one euro. Even if the price of that kind of samples, of course, is very like artwork, uh, dependent of rarity, uh, uh, st study about this, etc. So for me, those, those do, two um, pistes, two uh, ways to explore are the, 
will, uh, will help the university to, de to the decolonization of its collections. Okay, thank you, thank you Natalie. Thank you. Um, thank you for this uh, presentation that uh, already raised very uh, comments and, and, and um, uh, in the in the chat. Um, uh, it's it's a very, very interest, interesting uh, case, uh, your university, uh, uh, as you pointed out. Uh, I like the, I mean, it's also the, 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 the I mean, the students movement, uh, the new generation, Giovanna already said that it was there and so on. Um, so are there any questions? A quick one, because um, unfortunately, uh, we're already a bit late on the schedule. Well, Mind you, you know that we're going to have a whole round table about uh, repatriation. So it's not decolonization, but uh, we can also discuss these kind of things. But we will also discuss this, uh, this point uh, next year to, in our annual conference, because uh, it will be part of the, uh, not only of the workshop we would like to, to, to offer, but also uh, the questions we will raise in the call. So any question? Well, also, also if you don't mind, Natalie. Chat, Sebastian. Yeah. Yes. There are questions in the chat coming in. Is it? Because, uh, oh, yes, sorry. Marta. Okay. This type of collections also raise ethical issues of access. Shall, should we give permission to anyone, particularly for profit reason, without asking the communities of origin? Yes, that's, that's one qu good question more. And I'm not sure that my colleagues will think about that kind of question. So I will, of course, report. And, and I give them all the document, uh, UMAC, University of and every, every other institutions in, uh, in uh, CLUD in that kind of problematics produce. But they have to, they need help. And that's why I, in fact, it's me that put them in contact with the historians and with, with the archivists and so on. Because we need in transdisciplinarity to, to understand and to um, decolon decolonize our collections. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you. And, and now we're going to move to our second speaker, uh, Fiona Kearney uh, from, the from the Glucksmann Museum at the University College Cork in Ireland. Uh, Fiona Kearney is professor. Uh, she's the founding director of the Glucksmann an award-winning contemporary art museum at the University College Cork. In this position, she has curated numerous exhibitions of Irish and international art with a particular emphasis of how contemporary art practice relates to research directions within academic discourses. The title of your presentation, Fiona, is Creative Agency, Research, Advocacy and Cultural Action in Civic Spaces. Fiona. Thank you, Sebastian, and good morning, colleagues from uh, Cork in Ireland. Um, this is the building where I work, and we're very privileged to be part of the historic university campus. Um, and I would have said up until about 18 months ago, we would have absolutely considered the museum as the critical civic space in which our research and advocacy took place, where we would present exhibitions in partnership with colleagues that interrogate, um, as the previous speaker has looked at, really important issues of decolonization of um, global borders, as was the case in this, but going to more playful um, presentations that we have developed with our colleagues in the School of Law, where we commissioned artists to um, look at themes in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and working with our disability services on ways in which um, exhibitions can enable people who are blind or vision impaired to experience contemporary art practice. Um, what I want to focus on today is how we looked at 
engaging with our audiences on the topics of research, advocacy and civic space when actually we had to close our doors as a museum during the pandemic. Our audience is obviously focused on our student body, but in fact ranges is from zero to 100 years, predominantly through um, a very large scale schools program that we run on site. And as I'm sure with many of you, part of that is about encouraging access to third level education among young people. But we also like to see ourselves as a space where people who graduate have left university or still might consider um, learning within the university at a much older age. And our programmes for older people have, again, focused very specifically on bringing them into the museum as an entry point or platform to the opportunities that exist within third level. I think like many of you, when the pandemic hit, our first inclination was to go online and we focused again on creative activities for those people who, in Ireland in any case, we were put into a very severe lockdown where we couldn't move two kilometers from our own homes. So it was all about kitchen table creative activities that were delivered online and um, the UK Kids in Museums very generously gave us an international award for this work, which meant that suddenly we were engaging with audiences far beyond Ireland, but globally. So that was a very interesting and still steep learning curve, I would say, for our museum. But of course, as soon as we were able to, we looked at ways in which we might commission artists to present art in the public realm. And we did a very typical maneuver, which is to take over billboard spaces that previously would have been used for events, again, just to ask artists to um, create work specifically for these uh, poster uh, places. And we put these around the city center. Um, at this point, the campus is completely locked. There is no access. So it was just a way of providing audiences with some access to art. But I think for myself and the team, one of the things that was most strongly in the back of our minds was the quieter work, the less visible, engagement that we have been doing over the last five or six years with vulnerable communities and marginalized communities and specifically young refugees and asylum seekers, where again a huge focus was about enabling them to come to the museum as part of the wider welcome to a third level or even secondary level learning in Ireland. Um, I had been incredibly proud about the fact that when we had culminated one project, a film that these young refugees had made with us, and we had persuaded one of our local film festivals to present the work, um, that uh, Alia said that the Glucksman had become home to me, a place where you can come and express yourself. But as we were confined to our own homes, that phrase really um, began to sit with me in a quite uncomfortable way, because what if your place of residence does not feel like a home? What if you do not have access to the spaces that made you feel that you could express and be yourself? Um, and I think in the context of the work that we had done with young refugees, we were deeply aware of how uncomfortable and restrictive their living circumstances are. These are images that our colleagues in applied social science had sent around to the university, and it is what spurred the Glucksman's engagement with them. We work alongside colleagues in applied social sciences and development and law to breadthen the expertise that we need to work with this specific community. But you can see from the extraordinary visual expression dedicated, directed here to the most terrible ends, how incredibly creative these young people can be, but how it might feel to be you know, tamed within their uh, emergency accommodation centers, how awful that would be during a pandemic. So the focus where we had previously been bringing them to the museum now shifted to creating a space for them and the outdoor of the museum. We weren't allowed to bring them in, but we managed to get them on site. And we developed a whole series of projects that looked specifically at working outdoors. And this moved our civic action into a much broader space. Building on that billboard project, we received permission from our city council to create with our young refugees and asylum seekers, this extraordinary project, a billboard project, where they evolved artworks based on their ideas and identities and what they would like to say in the public realm and place them on these large scale billboards. We got them to install it themselves, I mean, with support from um, our own team, just so that they had this kind of engagement away from where they were living. 
And we used the city as a canvas, a place then to tell this story. And quite extraordinarily, I think during COVID, you know, people were very alert and involved and engaged with this work in a way that perhaps they mightn't have been had the city been slightly more busy with the usual business kind of uh, civic life population that exists. And we also received permission from our city library, which is right in the very center of Cork City, to use their front space. Again, something that I don't think would have happened prior to COVID. And that enabled us actually to share and engage. And it was picked up by a lot of the national newspapers in Ireland to allow us to really think about what it means to be in a civic space and to bring and platform these um, voices in a different way. So we worked again with Cork City Council and asked permission to create the first asphalt work in the city, which is um, essentially a kind of a road mural. We invited um, the uh, artist, Cathy Burke, and she worked alongside young people experiencing homelessness. So again, a cohort who are really disadvantaged specifically by the impact of the academic, um, the pandemic. <clears throat> Throughout this summer, we installed this work on a, a main kind of pedestrian thoroughfare in the city centre. Um, and so once again, not only did it enable the children to have an opportunity to express themselves, but it enabled an engagement with the city, with the sense of how culture can create a space for actually some very difficult conversations. Because while the mural itself is very colorful, a lot of it was about processing very difficult memories and experiences that the children were having into kind of more positive and creative contexts. Um, and it has become now a little bit of an Instagram talking point in our city and and continues to be um, a really wonderful part of the fabric of the urban realm in Cork. So we thought, how can we even push that further? <clears throat> Our schools program, which is about bringing a lot of children into the museum, again, is not possible with safe distance. So we worked with our colleagues in um, the Center for Planning Education and Research here in the university and in the School of Public Health building on the new relationship with Cork City Council to develop a research-led project so that over 2,000 children would be able to have a creative consultation that would actually feed into the city development plan. This was made possible because our colleagues in planning development um, were able to frame a set of research questions that we were interpreted and enabled through a series of creative workshops that we put online and delivered out to the schools, again, with the museum closed, um, and the students then in their own schools were able to develop these visual but also textual responses. And then working with our own MA students in public health and in the M-Plan degree here in the university, we collated this information. Again, we had thought maybe we'll get a couple of hundred, but we ended up with 2000. So it was a much larger data set than we imagined. Um, but we had many students really helping us with this and it's performed now an incredible evidence base for what children want to see in their city. Um, and I suppose as well as a lot of ice cream vans, because that seemed to be one very strong um, thing that they all wanted to see. There were some incredibly visionary, but also pragmatic suggestions from things like wider footpaths so that two children might be able to walk to school together to greater um, trees, a, a sense of biodiversity. And I think these will really now be taken on board by our planners because they are listening to a research-led, practice-focused, impact-driven university to the public and back into the city and civic realm. So we put that on display. As soon as the museum was opened, one of the first things that we opened WAC was to reflect and encourage the children to come in and see their own work. Um, and now going forward into the new academic term, we are thinking about ways in which even as the museum remains open, we can continue this dialogue through outreach and engagement in civic spaces, but also in spaces where our communities live, work and learn. And so we are developing a program called the Art Library, where we are taking a deep breath and loaning works from our collection with toolkits developed with colleagues here in the university. So drawing on the expertise of our environmental scientists, our architecture school to create toolkits that will mediate these works and provide learning opportunities, not just for schools. Here you see this a work by the artist Colin Crotty on display in a library and here in a care setting and home, because we are very aware that COVID and the pandemic has produced an anxiety about returning to public space. So what we want to do is be at the forefront of how people might retain their engagement of, of 
with art, but as a university museum to ensure that that continues the learning and growth that we would have always embraced within our campus based environment. And one of the more wonderful things that has happened is this kind of sense of intergenerational exchange that we hadn't thought possible in our own work is actually happening because of the way in which, of course, grandchildren want to visit and engage with art where their grandparents are and is allowing for a very important moment of connection um, in these COVID times. And that itself was picked up by one of our national newspapers. So I realize I'm just showing off now. But what I do want to say is that for all of us who have been struggling throughout COVID, I think there is learning. And the, the key thing that I wanted to share today was that in moving out into the civic spaces, there really are extraordinary new opportunities for the university through our cultural actions to engage in really important civic conversations that can be research led and impact driven. So I will say thank you in Irish. Gurv Mila Mahagat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Fiona, for this uh, very inspiring um, presentation. And of course, based on the on what you achieve uh, during this period. And uh, this is that gave us because we during the Henry Maggie presentation, people were asking how to start with and so on. But this is um, this is a very demonstration of how, how much museum can do uh, as actions to change things, to make community visible that end visible. Um, so it's a very, very thank you for this, uh, for sharing with us this, uh, this way of uh, being uh, committed in a civic, uh, in, a, in a civic engagement, promising uh, civic engagement. Any questions, colleagues, dear colleagues? One or two, yeah, there is a, ri a rising hand. I don't know who it is. I don't see. Uh, yeah, Silka, please. Thank you very much, Fiona. That was absolutely fabulous and really uh, something for all of us to learn from. Um, what I particularly like is the sustainability of it. So it's not a one-off, but the discussion, the, the, the dialogue has started and once the planners lick blood uh, in our German expression, once they get the hang of it, they realize what the value is. Uh, but it all sounds too fabulous almost. Was there any opposition? Anybody who said this is not what we should be doing? Anybody pushing back? Um, but maybe there wasn't. Uh, no, and thank you for asking that. Yes, of course. And I, I should say that the work that we've been doing with young refugees and asylum seekers is now in its sixth year. And we had a lot of learning along the way, but we couldn't have hit the ground running without the support of our colleagues in applied social studies who've been working with this cohort for 15 years. So it, but what they would say is that the thing that the cultural um, context brought was this huge visibility. And in the last two years, UCC has become a university of sanctuary. So I think what we allowed was a kind of a speeding up, but we benefited from that kind of really deep relationship that existed. And I think that is what you need is that trust takes a while. The other thing I will say is that I think that Ireland, probably not unlike anywhere else, has, you know, the moment that you engage with the asylum um, issue, it, it is within the social media space. We've had a lot of pushback, but we've developed guidelines and worked with our own arts council to learn how to, I'm actually, I suppose, mostly protect the young students who might be doing our social media around ways to kind of, you know, thoughtfully, but not get too involved in that. Um, and then I would say that really, we've been trying to do a lot of this work in the civic realm beyond the museum and it hasn't been possible. COVID made that possible. So for all the, oh my God, there's so many challenges of COVID. This was the silver lining for us was that suddenly the city council was saying yes. And not only were they saying yes, they could see when it was happening that the citizens wanted to engage with these issues. Um, so going forward, I think the challenge for us now is to kind of keep pushing and to keep engaging so that we have, we, you know, potentially bring even more difficult conversations. I mean, I often think about, as we know, we all do the museum as a safe space for those difficult conversations, but how exciting would it be to think of our city in that way? So, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we we should move forward with our third speakers. Uh, it's uh, it's all I know. It's always very frustrating because we, I mean, those two first presentations are so rich in many ways, and 
so we want to discuss it further but uh, okay let's play the what we are expecting to do and um, thank you very much Fiona for this very inspiring uh, project and action uh, in your museum and now um, our third speakers uh, is not uh, Daniel Sim as uh, it was uh, in our program but it's Chang Yu Sang, uh, a colleague from the News Museum in Singapore. Um, Chang is a curator of the News Museum and uh, she's currently leading the museum's outreach team. And indeed, uh, we had the chance to meet uh, when we had the UMAC meeting in Singapore and I have a very dear memory about it. So, um, Chang uh, kindly agreed to, 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 to take uh, the place of Danielle and she will uh, make her presentation with the title Critically and Popular Populism, Docent and Volunteer Training at the News Baba House. The floor is yours. It would help if I remembered to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, let me just share my uh, um, presentation. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, as, Dan uh, as uh, Sebastian mentioned, uh, Danielle uh, is not able to present this today. I'm presenting to her uh, for, on her behalf. Um, I'll just introduce um, the NUS um, Baba House. And as a preamble, um, I just want to say that um, the NUS Baba House uh, is a heritage house that runs regular trainings for individuals interested in um, volunteering and engaging with the house either as docents through leading guided tours. Um, this is a heritage house showcasing the Straits Chinese collection of the NUS Museum. And uh, the Baba House is often in the center of larger discourses and um, controversies surrounding Straits Chinese or Peranakan culture in Singapore. Um, this includes in particular the culture's risk of being essentialized or touristified due to public focus on its material culture um, and subsequent downplaying of the social, economic or political issues surrounding the culture. And uh, even though I'm touching on it very, very lightly today, right, I think the main point here and how it relates to this panel is that very often Peranakan becomes a shorthand for a particular kind of culture um, that kind of... Um, uh, forgets or rather glosses over the other cultures of origins that make up this hybrid um, form of um, heritage. So within the setting of the University Museum, it allows the integration of academic perspectives and pedagogy to the topic that is not otherwise um, the case within a public setting. And so the Baba House has structured the docent and volunteer training syllabus to try to involve academic criticality by engaging learning resources and academics from the university, while also unpacking populist themes that are the initial draw for very much of the public. Um, now, the term Puranakan stems from the Malay root word anak, and anak means child or offspring. Um, it has a number of meanings, but I think from Leo Suryadinata's introduction in his um, book, Puranakan Chinese in the Globalizing um, Southeast Asia, uh, one of the key definitions of Puranakan is the offspring of intermarriage between a native and a foreigner. Um, and they usually refer to groups of people who descended from traders, um, uh, who married locals in the Southeast Asian region, and some becoming um, early community leaders and mediators, which um, brings in a kind of a power dimension in, into this, um, the politics of the Peranakan community. Um, a hybrid culture also emerges from them in practice, uh, in terms of the practice of food, language, and other uh, costume, for example. Now, in Singapore, a television series known as The Little Nyonya came to typify um, public imagination of Peranakan culture, um, and in fact became so popular that it was remade into a television series in China in 2020. Um, elsewhere, when you mention the word Peranakan in Singapore, um, many people associate it with a per, um, particular neighborhood in the area of um, Juchat near East Coast, uh, with the, along with its pastel-themed houses. Now, this kind of um, short hands are not without problems. Um, as Karen Tio puts forth in her paper, Domesticating Hybridity, Straits Chinese Cultural Heritage Projects in Malaysia and Singapore, um, these popular images of the Peranakan, especially the Nyonya, um, manifest in visual discourses, um, elude complications and internal contradictions. 
And furthermore, by highlighting the seemingly uncontroversial realm of the women's world, these projects direct the public's gaze away from intense debates over ethnocultural and political loyalties that mark the evolution of Straits Chinese identity in the 19th century and the 20th centuries. And also when you um, single out and create an ethnic architectural enclave and calls it, call it Puranakan for touristic purposes, right? Henderson then points out there are also problems raised of expectations regarding an ethnic legacy um, that is no longer immediately evident to the casual observer. Like when people look at these houses, they don't understand how is this Puranakan, um, but it demands a reification of a more intangible dimensions of the past and present culture over commercialization of the built and cultural heritage still existing. So these kinds of debates and problematics are the, is the backdrop against which the NUS Baba House operates. Brief introduction um, to the NUS Baba House. Um, Sebastian, you've been to the museum, but if uh, you've not been to the Baba House, you know, I invite um, the next time anybody can travel, right, please come to NUS and then we'll bring you to the Baba House. Um, this was um, this is a house in blue and it was a heritage house that used to be the ancestral home to a family, um, the Wees. And it was built in the 1890s and occupied under the uh, 1980s and officially opened in 2008 after two years of restoration works after we acquired the house by a very generous donation. Um, so currently, it is a heritage house under the NUS Museum, uh, and we showcase the social history of the Peranakans, as well as use the house very actively as an example of ongoing architectural preservation. Um, and the gallery on the third floor hosts contemporary conversations surrounding the Peranakan cultures in the form of exhibitions and um, project displays. Now, here is um, you know, some, some shots of the interiors of the house, um, very nice. Um, but I think this is where also part of the problematic arises. When people look at these pictures, they think that this defines Peranakan culture. Um, but I, I think the reality of the work that we want to do and we want to highlight that we do um, is the work that is centered around the house, its archaeology, to root out all the different diverse um, cultural um, influences that is um, uh, behind this house. Um, now, some of, uh, okay, while Puranakan culture heavily relies on the visual and material culture of the Puranakans, for Monsion and Parasaram, um, Puranakan identity uh, is conceived as a site of contestation through which the meanings of Singaporean identity are disassociated from previous understandings of cultural identities, such as Chineseness and indeed Malay heritage elements. Um, in other words, Peranakan identity is asserted as its own category and problematically increasingly disassociated from the cultural inheritance of its own origins um, and regrounded as local and indigenized sense of belonging. Um, thus, it is rooted in, but it transcends conventional identities. And now, uh, what do we mean um, by that? Um, I, I mentioned earlier that you know it has now become a, an, a class, a, a cultural identity of its own, um, but it dilutes then the uh, influences of its origins. And um, while Monsignor and Parasram are referring in their paper to specifically to the Little Nyonya TV series, the same might be alluded to the exhibition that was sent by the National Heritage Board um, as the exhibition that represents the cultural mix of Singapore. Um, and this is um, Baba Bling uh, that was held at the uh, Musée du Quai Branly in uh, 2010 in Paris. And the Baba Bling exhibition um, may be a better example than Little Nyonya to make Monsignor and Paras Ram's point um, that Puranakanness is not here done as a process of self-determination, but rather as a state-sponsored exercise in grounding identity and state formation practices in everyday cultural activities, products, and performances. We see, therefore, then, a gap in the two discourses. The populist view takes one aspect of Peranakan culture, particularly visual culture, <coughs> as a convenient main discourse. For example, the Peranakan Tal, which is a uh, you know house at the bottom of uh, this wall feature here, um, you know we call they are shorthanded, um, co shorthandedly called the Peranakan Tal, but the Tal itself, in fact, has our cultural origins extending to Dutch Tals, sometimes produced in Japan, imported and used in British colonies as far as India and Malaya, and these influences are assumed and dispersed when we label the Tal with the Peranakan label. Um, when we shorthand the materials and identities as Peranakan, it therefore does not paint a more holistic picture of other issues surrounding the culture, such as topic relating to Peranakan business 
history, political affiliations, national loyalties, or social interactions with other early communities. And one of the self-criticisms that we have become aware of is that the stories of the diverse community around um, the Baba House, including those of the servants, um, need to become a little bit more um, increasingly included in the curriculum that we include in the school uh, in the in the Baba House. Now we find ourselves in this discursive uh, gap in which uh, the docent training program at Baba House um, is, uh, is at the same time a, a university museum program. Um, and uh, the role of the museum uh, is to inject some sense of pedagogy, um, looking at the culture from a museological academic point of view um, and integrating curatorial input and research evidence in the representation of the culture of the house. And we, we should be using the Baba House as a space of discussion and exploration um, rather than simply just um, you know, showcasing um, the, the, the heritage and uh, social history only. And the vision that we have for our dozen and volunteers is that they are to be able to present to these topics with nuance um, to university students um, and public alike. But I think what, one of the things that we recently have discovered that you're always going to get a public that come in and all they want is the heritage, right? And then if you give them a little bit more, um, they're going to get um, turned off and not interested. So what we're thinking is that maybe we need to differentiate our programs into the general heritage tours, but also we may, may need to be crafting um, programs such as Go Deeper, where they look a little bit more deeper into these issues that we want to uh, be a little bit more critically about. Um, and also then we try to collaborate with academics and researchers um, to facilitate certain conversations during the dozen training program. Um, so we engage, um, for our talks are then divided into these four kinds of um, general broad categories, you know, we engage academics, curators, history consultants, um, heritage enthusiasts to talk about um, issues of heritage and preservation and conservation from their perspectives. And we try to ensure a proper balance between the four topics such that one is not favored more than the other and therefore it doesn't fall too much um, in the on off balance into uh, heritage enthusiasm, for example. Um, and we, fo uh, we form um, reading groups to ensure that the docents are then able to engage critically and academically with the text without alienating them, them with too much jargon. Um, the way it turns out is that the training is twice a week for eight weeks um, four hours a, a day, um, and then they're split into four main modules, um, presentation and public speaking skills, Peranakan social life, architecture and restoration, and the Baba House history. Um, and I think this year, uh, we, during our training, we accepted 16 trainees um, to embark on the training program. And uh, because of COVID, uh, the training was, um, you know, in, uh, um, let's see now, it was hybrid, physical, and uh, virtual as well, uh, as in when the uh, guidelines change all the time. Can you um, may conclude at some point? Yes, I'm nearly there, yes. So I think one of the one of the ways that we try to get away from the controversies because there are people who come and their their intention is to promote and preserve Peranakan culture, and one of the ways we try to avoid that or uh, stay away from that right, is that then we focus very much on the house and its own fabric, right? Because this then becomes something that um, it becomes a little bit less controversial. We're talking about the architectural issues and how the house was used. Um, to conclude, the presentation of Peranakan culture through the University Museum ensures. Um, I cannot read my slide, um, ensures that it uh, both uh, engages and affirms the collection and the material culture that is present while placing it in the context of wider societal history and academic research. Um, and we steer, we try to steer away from populist notions of Peranakan and contextualize the presentation of the house and the family's history um, to avoid pigeonholing of the culture in the public realm. Um, and then the docent and volunteer training then paves a way for the public to access these themes addressed by the university museum, therefore slowly forming a base upon which such conversations can occur more if in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shang. Um... <laughs> For this very, uh, very, uh, very good presentation, and uh, and also very, uh, very important uh, issue for us as museum, and for those who've been uh, in Singapore who know about the uh, Singapore, they know that this kind of issue of identity and cultural heritage are very important, and I and and I think uh, when I went there, I, it was the first time I was confronted to to uh, the University Museum who raised this issue of identity, of colonialism also. I think the exhibition was on colonialism and the input of social science, how much you, you succeeded to, to do it. And also raising the, the, the point that uh, of, um, 
the role of museum to to participate to uh, civic engagement and to uh, and not only as you said uh, showcases with cultural heritage so that's a very important point a very quick question before we're going to our last uh, speaker i've got the authorization of the supreme leader mata uh, for five minutes more but uh, it's going to be a very quick questions anyone I can't see anyone raising hands. I think all everybody's just like this. <laughs> Sorry, Chang. So, wow, the presentation was fantastic. And uh, we all, for those who didn't go to Singapore, please go to the nurse and follow the nurse uh, project because there's always very, very, very interesting. Thank you for your for your job, and hopefully see you uh, see you very soon. Thank you. Okay, so I'm turning to my. To my last speakers, Leila. Um, okay, so Leila uh, is um, sorry, Leila Zwiller, of course, uh, your family name. Uh, she's uh, from the History of Technology, uh, uh, Technical University of Denmark, and uh, she's head of the History of Technology Group. And her research interests are in on uh, the history and interpretation of technical academia. Techno science, very important knowledge and academic heritage. She is responsible for the historical collection of the DTU and she teaches history of technology and knowledge history. So, Leila, the title of your presentation is Festive, Fraudulent, or Just Strange? That is a question. Shared authority and the ethics of an anniversary. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, try and share my screen now. Let's see what happens. Hope the best. So, work. is it working? Yes. Yes. Good. First step. So, let's see if I can actually get to uh, turn it into a presentation. You have to put it on um, like you're you're doing a, a normal presentation slideshow. Yeah, I know. It, the only thing is the bottom bit of my screen is now covered by something else, so okay. I'm trying to uh, to get to it. Slideshow. Uh, Can go on slideshow. Yes. On the top of your screen. On the top, I can use this. Brilliant. Yes. Um, or press five F five Layla F five. I'm gonna try that then. Um, oh, now I think it's yeah. You've got it yeah. now. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, letting me speak. Yeah, I got all the way to the bottom of the screen, but um, I want to talk about an anniversary and the shared authority and ethics of this anniversary and the anniversary in question is uh, 200 years for the discovery of electromagnetism which we celebrated in Denmark in 2020 bad year for this sort of thing and uh, we are very much connected to this story at my university because we discovered that it was H. Jose Astor who discovered electromagnetism and he's one of the founders of the Technical University of Denmark. So the Technical University of Denmark headed the celebrations together with many partners. Jose Oerstel is a romanticist scientist and deeply religious man. So he is very versatile in his ways of gaining knowledge. He believes, for example, in using arts to gain knowledge. Hence, many people can have something to say about Oerstel. Uh, and he was kind of ripped apart and reassembled in this process, which I will tell you more about now. In the project, we wanted to go for shared authority so that a lot of different voices would be able to be heard in, in this uh, project. And it was basically kind of bring your own. So all sorts of actors could come in and do whatever they believe was the right thing to do. So we wanted to try and achieve this, this kind of the shared authority project with centering on, on audiences 
uh, and not being the guardians of history, but rather opening up to, uh, to different voices. So we want to also try and, and build uh, communities around this story, but also include as many as possible. So hence we had to have this, the, the shared authority. And another important point here is also, we can't control what audiences take away anyway. And so trying to, to be their guardians is, is not gonna work anyway. I think that's kind of well-established. We make our own meanings of whatever happens. So maybe it's better to just facilitate more discussion. Now I'm, as Sebastian so nicely put it, uh, I'm from the uh, DCO History Group. And uh, we had our own ideas about why we wanted to be part of this project. We wanted to build on shared national memory, make sure that this is remembered amongst Danes. We also wanted to show the doings of knowledge in everyday life. This is 200 years ago. So a lot has happened. This could be very interesting. We wanted to form a dialogical space because a lot of people could come into this space and talk to each other and it would be brilliant if university actors would start talking with more people in the in more general publics in this way. <clears throat> Sorry. But we also wanted to show this kind of the surprising strangeness of this discovery. As I talked about Erstel and, and arts, some might not think that arts was important in this specific uh, discovery, but it certainly is. So there's a lot of things going on here that's very interesting to talk about. And we wanted to show the process of how something is acknowledged as knowledge, which is for me a main point about doing this is that what actually makes something knowledge, now it's now, it's uh, generally acknowledged. What you see in the picture is by the way, uh, reproduction, but how we're using some of the original equipment used by Erstel um, when discovering electromagnetism. Another important point for us at DTU as historians was to take care of the memory of our university and respecting the fact that it's an identity story for some of the people who work amongst us and our community. And hence, if we treat this carelessly and harshly, you might, I, that's why I have a picture of someone popping the balloon, then, and, and kind of tell people off for misunderstandings, then we, we are messing with something big. So we have to be mindful of, of that memory work should be healing and friendly, and we should have respectful conversations about it. However, we also have to be mindful of that the genius scientist is important for the reputation of a university and hence the university will want these kind of stories. They need them to show that, that this is, we are a, a high ranking university. So we also have to be respectful of this though we as historians may not really want to do this. We may want to do something else. So a lot of actors came in on the projects, which started about six years before the actual anniversary. So there were many, many people involved in this in all sorts of ways. And people could more or less freely flow into the project and do their thing. And one of the things you see here is an artwork made by DCU scientists and an artist working really on sound and not so much on electromagnetism, but still, very interesting work. So that was one of them. And of course, one thing we, we expected that this could be difficult. And of course, I like, I like this quote by Flick from 1935 about the knowledge cultures. Whatever is known has always seemed systematic, proven, applicable, and evident to the knower. Every alien system of knowledge has likewise seemed contradictory, unproven, inapplicable, fanciful, and mystical. And yes, we experience this process of how strange it is to accept someone else's knowledge as knowledge when it's foreign to you. 
So we knew that there was going to be some, some uh, problems. Also, of course, COVID was a massive blow. All the early events was canceled. We had to change really, really quickly to try and become online people. And uh, where we were saved by a summer of, of a lull in, in COVID in Denmark. So all the Danes were allowed to get out, but they were not allowed, they couldn't travel anywhere. So there were a lot of Danes out and about and at museums and, and everywhere. And so they took part in so many events, but also people were kind of bored. So they were very willing to take care, uh, take part in online experiments and, and whatever was, was going on online. So that kind of meant that we did have a big celebration. You can see some of the many things that went on, the exhibitions and walks and events, and there was film and teaching materials and even medals and prizes something I'd never thought of. There were books of all sorts, for children, for adults, academic, all sorts of things were going on and lots of just even cities were doing their own thing. So it was really interesting. However, it also meant that there were so many voices. And, and of course, we all know this, that there's gonna be a lot of kind of individual memory practices without source criticism, without methods. So these voices were all out there and we were giving them a platform. And of course, messages had to be simplified all the time for different purposes. Some of the experts felt this was fraudulent. This was really, really unethical. We should not take part in this. And of course, there's also unintended messages whenever you, for example, highlight one researcher, you're certainly not showing the whole big complicated story of all the people who took part. So some of the experts were actually quite angry. Some of them stopped taking part in, in the project. And uh, as I said, Asta is a romanticist and hence many academic disciplines and were, were part of this and the boundaries between who can know what about something that happened two years ago and then the whole development to, through 200 years were very, very blurred. And I often heard talks that kind of made me cringe a bit and go, no, for me as a historian, this is wrong, what you're saying right now. But then keeping an open mind and saying, well, it, but it's right from this perspective. Leila, I think if you, if you, if you can conclude, that, yes. would be, that would be brilliant. Good. Um, so we saw ourselves mainly as facilitators in this. We provided this kind of secretarial function and calendars and, and advertising. The university, our university helped with funding and pushing the project into many different spaces. We also kind of did some basic things of a basic text about what is the ups and downs of this kind of very factual story, but also pointing to some of the more difficult parts of it. So we offered a lot of help with stories and heritage and fact checking. What are all the concepts? Uh, we provided advocacy when someone was asking us to take part in a project. We might, for example, warn them about the unintended messages they were in somehow sending. But we would, of course, accept it if they said, well, that's good and well, but we'll do our thing. But we also did a lot of talks where there was much time for debate and open questions. And this was actually almost a little bit scary because it's so great to just fill the time when you are a speaker, you are asked to tell someone something, but then the audience start asking all sorts of questions. But this led to a very good atmosphere where people were exchanging. So, however, the experts had most difficulties with this, disliking this kind of, some felt that this should, we should do new history rather than maybe, maybe there was too much repeating old stories. However, others felt that this was important because otherwise we forget them, even if we're not doing something new. And I felt that there was a lot of recombination and sharing different perspectives. And this actually led to a lot of new insights for many of the participants, but also that the uh, lay people who took part, who weren't experts, felt that they were given a voice because if the experts aren't agreeing, then we can do whatever we want to. So at the end of the day, the measurement was that 36% of Danes kind of knew about these celebrations and kind of 
more than a million took part. That's actually quite a lot for a small country. The audience was empowered. It was quite clear that they felt that they also had a voice. And I learned a lot. I actually thought I knew this story quite well, but uh, it turns out that there was a lot for me to learn still. And uh, hence, the, both electromagnetism and Arsenal was reassembled for me in the end, even though they, it was all kind of ripped apart. And uh, thank you very much. That was all I was saying about Arsenal and electromagnetism. Thank you so much, Leila. Uh, well, I'm just amazed. We had just four wonderful presentation and four presentation that would have needed like at least 20 minutes to discuss or even an hour for each. Uh, because this is also a very important subject for us, huh? uh, because um, um, of course, celebration and so on, as I said, it's always a good way to, to, to rethink about this history, to try to move forward, to, to be aware about this. Uh, and it's also very important for the identity of the institution. So the, your project uh, was also confronted to this, uh, you know, importance of uh, identity and equilibrium and the change in generation or uh, the clash between different uh, approach uh, between uh, different uh, academic communities also. As historian, we know that, okay, it's normal that that history can evaluate and uh, it, there's lots of perspectives to take into account. So yeah, I think that um, how to deal with, uh, it reminds us that uh, all the constraints we have uh, uh, a local level, institutional level, uh, social level, political level, and 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 how? But it's always it's there's always a way, there's always a way to to do it. And you gave us a very good, very good example for that. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm I'm very sorry because uh, we will we will not have time for any questions as the otherwise. Uh, Marta will kill me, uh, yes, uh, because uh, we really need to now to start the, the AGM of UMAC. Uh, thank you so much, um, the four of you, uh, for those very insightful uh, presentation. Um, well, I learned so much. It's very, um, very inspiring for me also. So thank you, thank you, and very well done for this fabulous project. Um, just to remember uh, that uh, the, the AGM will only be for UMAC members. So you have to have a, actually an um, uh, ICOM, uh, ICOM um, member. Uh, uh, you have to, to be uh, an ICOM member. But for those who are not, you can attend. And Martin is giving you the, 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 the link uh, on YouTube. So you can it, uh, attend online. It will be live screening.